Let's have a look there first of all at the campaign itself because now that the voting's over we can be a little bit mischievous about it. And there was a great deal of mischief to be had. Jeremy Vine reports on the campaign. It was bound to happen. The three-cornered campaign here turned a postcard picture of tranquility into a blur of placards and music. Tory party workers here hoped John Major's leadership gamble would shore up their support and within days of his victory launched a low-profile campaign. A mistake perhaps, as they then found out they had a star on their hands. We can do both sides. Is everything I want? Their candidate, John Hudson, had a style all of his own. We're going to win. I know we are. Just put money on you at Labbrook oh, down the road. <laughs> oh, did you hear this? Where is he now, Jeremy? I've got somebody here who's just been to Ladbrokes to put oh, money on me. Got money on it at Ladbrokes now. How's this? <laughs> No head was left unturned as Labour's man manufactured his local appeal. Yeah, well, let's, uh, see, what you do is you put each one of those, they're automatically disinfected. Phil Woolis, a smooth-talking former London TV producer and trade union press officer, booked a holiday home here and put hours of effort into proving he was not a comer-in, as locals would say. <laughs> but still not to everyone's satisfaction. At least Clark Kent used a phone box. The Lib Dem Superman did his costume changes in the open, enjoyed the company of other long distance runners, and clearly saw himself as MP material. His bid to join his Commons colleagues has been a marathon effort. He's come second here twice. This time, in fact, he was so quick off the mark, he was accused of starting to campaign while Geoffrey Dickens was seriously ill. Mr. Davis exudes a kind of manic energy that has rubbed some up the wrong way, but he bore up well under the rigours of what became a punishing by-election. And no wonder, because all the parties began their campaigns here really believing they could win. The Conservatives simply thought this by-election might be different. Perhaps their national problems had evaporated. Maybe John Major really had turned a crucial political corner. The Liberal Democrats on 36% last time were the obvious contenders, but then so much has changed since the last general election here, when Labour got one vote in five. No one really expected the Labour Party to come to Littleborough and Saddleworth and fight their campaign as they did. Down. It's a single track. Uh, there aren't enough the mark of the spin doctor's spin doctor, uh, Peter Mandelson, was all over Labour's campaign, and, uh, a sign of its seriousness. He was ever-present, whether winking at journalists or laying out lines of attack the Liberal Democrats said were some of the most unpleasant they'd ever faced. Are you still worried about Chris Davis's business interests as you were on Wednesday? Or have you stopped Well, I think that there is a difference between challenging a candidate on the basis of his public positions and public statements and the policies on which he is fighting this election on the one hand and on the other libeling an opponent on the basis... But any impression this was a maverick yes. Mandelson operation was countered by a string of shadow cabinet appearances. He is relevant because he is a minder, the minder, indeed he is the minder of the Conservative candidate in this by-election. Told an astonished House of Commons that the car boot sale is the enshrinement of Conservative philosophy. <laughs> So total was his dominance of the Labour campaign, at times he seemed to believe he was the candidate. Nice to be upstaged at one's own press conference. Um, right. As usual, Mandelson's own interests are at stake too. He's here to show his critics his leader's faith in him is not misplaced. Here's to Phil Willis. Hooray! Outside the news conferences, Labour's official candidate was a bit more forthcoming. Oh, you'll be voting on Thursday. I will love but his jolliness met with a mixed reception. It's not every day that self-service comes with a political sales pitch. Do you want it filling or...? Um, four pounds. Four pounds. I used to do this. Did you? I had a job doing this as the uh, SO it was. It wasn't... Voters were sometimes not that keen. Maybe it was because they were bracing themselves for a more negative message. You live in Littleborough where you've got to vote. So I hope you'll be voting Labour, but if not... Labour insisted it was sticking to the issues and said no one was being put off. There you are. I haven't lost the touch. 
so in this case, a cheap trick rather than a dirty one. Well, anyway, oh, you'll be voting Labour on Thursday because we think we need a change. Bye. But at times, the inflammatory dialogue between the two opposition parties, with Labour telephone canvassers even instructed to ask voters their views on drugs, seemed very much at odds with the beauty of the scenery. And sometimes the scenery took its revenge. This was a day when Labour claimed to have brought 2,000 members into the constituency from branches nationwide. The Liberal Democrats said the figure was fictional. As it turned out, there were certainly a few too many branches. For comfort. While there were signs of the seven other candidates standing here, they were rarely seen in person. Unlike Paddy Ashdown, who arrived five times. His party began the campaign with steely determination. The Tories, they said, were the target. Labour were irrelevant. They would concentrate on key local issues. We might just consider a little the fact that uh, if Jeppe has fallen, the very small Bosnian army unit there has put up what is by any standards a remarkable and heroic mm. resistance. Aside from their bid for the local Bosnian Muslim vote, the Liberal Democrats ensured their campaign line was totally straight. Our target is the Tories. Exactly. Yes. We're not tackling Labour. Yeah, yeah. Our target is the Tories. It's the Tories who have to be beaten, and we will concentrate our fire on them. And I Although Mr Ashdown did have to deliver the odd sideswipe. Can I say, Chris, that we're going to have a housing bill in the next Parliament, and I'm really looking forward to having you there to help me. Do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> it's my decision. <laughs> <laughs> But in the middle of the campaign, the fanfares suddenly sounded for Labour. Two polls on the same day suggested they'd surged into second place, with the Liberal Democrats not that far ahead and the Conservatives out of the race. Beat the toys and send the government a message they remember. The Liberal Democrat approach changed dramatically. Suggested to the Labour Party. They threw some dirt themselves at the Labour candidate, saying he wasn't telling the truth about where he lived, supported the miners' strike as a student, was at odds with Tony Blair, all backed up with sheafs of press cuttings. And what we're having now is the key matter which has always been crucial in Little Britain Sadworth, and that is to squeeze the Labour vote. Because the Conservatives in this constituency have triumphed time and time again by devising the opposition parties. Can you describe what sort of panic gripped this building when you uh, got the results of those polls yesterday? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> so the bravado, at least, was still there, and there was anger too when Mr. Davis was asked how he could justify his personal attacks. Let's just justify the claws. <laughs> Stick to the claws, Paul. Let's talk about the pot calling the kettle black. You know, many of you journalists have been very co have been going going along to uh, briefing sessions at the Labour Party and hearing day after day drip. Drip, drip of poison personally directed against me using all the campaign techniques of the very worst of American practice. And for, for now, these questions to be put to us. But all we're doing is uh, revealing some of the truths about, uh, about some of the, the claims being made or the, or the, the disguise being, being put on by the Labour candidate, I think is uh, quite astonishing. No, we've got all the information here. We'll happily share with it afterwards. <laughs> see you later. Right, right. right. see you later. Bye. Bye. Nothing to hide here, even though Kathleen Hudson's spouse once stood as a Labour councillor. John Hudson was the moving target no one shot at in this campaign. With no news conferences, the Tories said they had more time to meet the voters. One more time. Hello. Morning. Morning. Nice to find some. Lovely, isn't it? <laughs> it's nice, but it's, it's, not, it's not weather yeah. for jackets, is it, John no. Boyce? No. How are you? All right. All right. Yeah. Have you got any... Uh, burning issues that you wish to discuss on this election? No, not really, love, but I know I'll be doing that. You know you'll be voting for me? Yes, well, I will, that's definitely. wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, if everybody does that, and mm -hmm. we all go to the polls, we'll show them that we can win like we've done three times before. Yes, I know that. And I think we're yeah. going to do it. Mm. So I think it's great. It's lovely of you today, because right, I know you can see right across to the chemical works on the other side. Yes, but up here it's very windy. But but Mr Hudson was not kept completely out of view. He was a connoisseur of the reporters' huddle. 
The key to it is me getting my voters to the polls and we shall win. It, it is a close thing and I do need them all there. I'm not sure. But I don't want these frighteners going on from these bogus polls and people saying we're out of it. That's a load of cogswallop. Lord Archer, a veteran soundbite peddler himself, interrupted what he said was the seventh redraft of his new novel to try and help Mr Hudson rewrite the pundit's forecasts. I hope everybody heard that noise. A sort of ill manners one expects from the Labour Party. And I might say in passing, if that is what Tony Blair thinks the British people want, heaven help us. Terrible. We do, don't we? Towards the end, Mr Hudson was looking ragged after hearing his chances written off so often. But the idea that the Tory core vote could be in hiding and more loyal than at other by-elections brought up cabinet big guns. In fact, so many big guns moved here, the constituency briefly became a kind of political parade ground. to be asked about how much difference all this will make as the next election the seat disappears. But the timing of this contest at the end of such a turbulent political year means the result will send a powerful message to all three parties. Jeremy Vine's report on the campaign. It's just one minute after midnight and our latest information is that round about quarter past 12 is likely to be the time when we may get the result.